This is the problem with our reform discourse, which is we keep saying state capacity, capacity is not going to, capacity is very expensive. Statisticians are very expensive. You have a broken down statistical system in the state, right? I'd love to see an incredible investment in India's statistical apparatus. You can't do health interventions because you don't have an epidemiological mapping of the country, right? Zero investment in state capacity, right? Uh, so in all of those things that actually matter, it is actually a deeply pessimistic budget. It's basically saying, let's be prudent because we are not sure. It's you know uncertain trajectory. Um, uh, we don't know what to do with the state, uh, as it were, and we don't know what this underlying kind of diagnosis is. What also politically worries me about this budget, no matter what your ideological views on the government, and you know the government evokes strong ideological feelings, there was one school of thought that this government has made a political pact with the extreme right, which is you do the culture stuff, you let us do the economy stuff, right? That was the sort of the contract within the party, that's how, right? I'm actually beginning to think that the lack of political boldness in the budget, and the political boldness means this government has not taken a pol single political risk in its two years in power, actually suggests something deeper. What it suggests is, it is actually going to invest all its political capital fighting those culture battles, and not do the hard economic stuff. You know, which is different from the, as sinister as that older social contract was, you take care of culture, we'll take care of economics. It's actually, no, it's we are going to spend all our political capital on politics. And I think this, you know, the, the beginning in parliament is a very clear indication of that, right? So don't, 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 don't expect great and deep investments in political capital, right? On the politics side of it, um, the investment in the social sector. Very deeply worrying. It's very deeply worrying for a couple of reasons. Uh, of course, you know, again, it's an illusion to think these sectors are not going to cost money. I think Prashanti is absolutely right about that. Uh, UGC allocations have been slashed. Very clear indication that this government is not going to uh, it does not see a future for public universities. Okay, it's very clear. If you don't read the writing on a wall, you're reading, living in a fool's paradise. Okay? Uh, you cannot imagine again a vibrant 21st century economy. And India, you know, is in this position. It's both our challenge and opportunity that it has to do everything together. You have to be in the high-value-added research end of this thing, and you have to be in the private, in the in the, in the primary end of the on the scale, right? Uh, very clear indication this government doesn't even begin to understand what the issues are with education and has absolutely zero commitment to reforming it in any meaningful way. Okay? But the health and education story is also important for the other economic side of the story. I mean, as, as you know, almost everybody in the private consultancy business has been saying over and over again, A, we don't know how health and education is priced in this country. Right? These are probably the sectors with the two highest degrees of inflation. Probably absorb income incre increases the greatest. Right? So if you're serious about stimulating other kinds of demand, you need to tackle health and education. I mean, Piketty gets a bad name in this country. I don't know quite why, but one of the very important points he makes, you'll have inflated GDPs when you have greater private health and education. Right? So even if you want the demand side of the story to continue, right, you need to invest in health and education. And there's no, there's no conception, there's no framework. What is the framework for health? We are doing a pastiche. What is the 10-year plan about what is the architecture of health delivery you want? Right? NHS style, totally private insurance, totally out of pocket. Unless you work backwards from that, there is no framework for even understanding what these allocations actually add up to. Right? So it's, 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 it's a budget that has given up. And to be fair, all governments are responsible for this. And we haven't had a good education minister since God knows when. Right? We haven't had a major health reform, serious health minister since God knows when. Right? 
But at this point in the 21st century, again, reflects incredible pessimism about these two sectors. Right? So I, th I think it's actually a deeply sort of you know, pessimistic budget. One, this last point, and then I, then I kind of end it there. How will the politics of this budget play out? Uh, I think the middle class is not going to be happy, which may not be a bad thing. It's, it's sometimes good from an economic point of view not to keep the middle class happy. But, but that was a very big constituency for this government. Uh, frankly, I think the miscommunication over this provident fund, the, the PPF thing, and the government's absolutely atrocious framing of the issue. Why can't they have done a simple thing saying, look, this is the 10-year pension architecture we want to move to. In that context, these steps make sense, right? Instead, what you got was all kinds of patronizing, patronizing, patronizing nonsense about how people don't know how to spend their own money, right? Uh, so the middle class is going to lukewarm, right? Farmers, that is the big rhetorical pitch in this budget. If they deliver on everything else, PMGSY, agriculture, I mean, look, irrigation has been around for a long time, as you know. The, Irrigation trust is not new. Maybe two or three years' time, some turn around. But the fact of the matter is, in the short run, when you have rural demand collapsing and a serious agrarian crisis, there is not going to be much infusion of cash in the rural economy. Right? So again, what was the diagnosis? Are you actually trying to stimulate big rural demand or not? What is the extent of that? Right? So I don't think people are going to sort of feel that, as it were, that there's a, you know, there's, there's a, so, and as I said, they have frittered away, I think, almost all their political capital on, you know, completely sort of irrelevant, at least irrelevant to the economy, in, other than in negatively destructive issues. So my sense of this budget is that if one were to rate it highly, one would rate it highly for prudence, as everybody has been saying. But there are different kinds of prudence. There's one prudence which says, this is prudence because we actually know what we are doing. And there's a kind of prudence which says, which says we actually don't know what we are doing, so we might as well be prudent in this fiscal sense. I'm afraid it looks more like the second. Because as I said, we are happy we haven't been you know, delivered pinpricks, no injections, no big operation. But you know, will growth be revived? We don't know. Is, is lack of demand the basis of growth? We don't know. Will this budget address that? We don't know. Infrastructure, see, I just saw Vinayak Chatterjee kind of saying, forget infrastructure for two years, right? You're not going to get a major revival. If that's the situation we are in, then actually you need a different kind of diagnosis. So we've got a prescription, no injection. I don't know whether we're going to be cured. And given our politics, Haryana, Gujarat, right, states where the BJP is going to losing big time ground, expect this to be a really socially conflictual year from hell. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patap. Um, uh, let me uh, make an honest confession here. Uh, before uh, we were having a meeting before this conference, and. I had made the mistake of suggesting that why not ask Pratap to make the first presentation. Now I know why the tradition is to have him speak at the end. Uh, because I wonder uh, whether the, some of the optimism that we expressed earlier about the budget could have been uh, sustained uh, after his uh, wonderful presentation that made us uh, look a little odd. Uh, just, uh, you know, um, before, uh, now we'll start uh, with the, the question answer session from the floor. But before I do that, while you uh, sort of uh, sharpen your wits to prepare your questions, let me quickly go over uh, our panelists and ask a couple of questions to each of them. And I will start with Pratap. And uh, uh, it's been said that this budget uh, uh, targets the rich and wealthy. Uh, examples are uh, the additional dividend tax in the hands of them, uh, even the, um, uh, the one person surcharge on those who are earning more than one crore. Uh, how, where do you see uh, this taxing the rich uh, uh, fit in in your understanding of the politics of the budget? See, I mean, 
you know, A just re reinforces the point uh, that this is not a literally bold budget. Uh, what you would have liked if you were really bold, I mean, the long-term strategy for the Indian state has to be increasing tax over GDP ratios. It has to be increasing the share of direct taxes, right? Not touched at all. So I don't mind actually the, 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 the slight increase in taxing the rich. I mean, that's, that's perfectly fine. And they'll have perfectly sensible ways of evading it as well. So it'll probably turn out to be sort of OK. I mean, I, I mean I, I, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. But I think it, it, it does signal a sort of a search for easy solutions. Um, and easy solutions are often non-solutions. Uh, uh, and in that sense, I think it's worrying. I mean, I don't mind, intrinsically mind that increase in tax, um, but I don't think it's in, accompanied by a signal. And, and, and look, if you don't begin to do this now, right, because the point about direct taxes is that it also changes the relationship between citizens and state, right, as the economic survey very rightly says. If you're not going to embark on that process now, uh, you know, this whole indirect tax, the reliance of the indirect tax business, uh, you'll also get very indirect services. Uh, let me turn to Rajat. Um, Rajat, uh, uh, this budget is also uh, uh, being seen as uh, ushered in great tax reforms. And, uh, but there are also critics who say that uh, many of the taxation changes are actually might make India a little more protectionist. Uh, that's one. Uh, and the second uh, question would be uh, that uh, what is the credibility of these dispute resolution bodies when companies are in the first place saying that uh, I am not supposed to pay this tax. So why are you asking me to pay the tax uh, just because I don't have to pay the penalty in interest? So is that dispute resolution meant for some telecom companies uh, are real? Uh, or and, and the first question is, uh, is the tax structure become a little more protectionist because there are discretionary interventionist tax rate changes? Yeah, no, so, so I, I don't think that overall we are becoming more, more protectionist. At least the budget doesn't reflect that overall we are becoming more protectionist. In fact, you know, a number of uh, foreign companies now take advantage of, uh, you know, sometimes take advantage of our WTO uh, commitment, sometimes take advantage of, like Korea and Japan, take advantage of the FTAs uh, to, to, to kind of sell products at low import duties in India. But, you know, the, particularly the steel sector has been bleeding and there's been a lot of representation made to the government to increase uh, import duties and countervailing duties. And one of the things is that if you look at our multilateral commitments, we have our bound rates and our applied rates. There's a big wedge between our bound rates and applied rates, and therefore the, the kind of temptation incrementally to, to protect certain industries because of what Pratap mentioned is that you know, because of greater access of the industry is bleeding, and of course there are global vulnerabilities. So, but I, I don't think I would go to say that in the in the trade regime in the external sector that overall there is a sense that we are becoming more protectionist because I think this is the time when actually we have to re really think and this will really think especially off budget what we are going to do uh, in our engagement with the APEC, with the RCEP, and with TPP. I don't think, just like there isn't a vision in the budget uh, uh, about where we are going in certain sectors, I don't think there is a vision that we have on where, how we are going to address this huge global shift uh, of trade uh, if the TPP actually happens. That's where I think we should, and that is likely to be uh, much more off budget. On your second question, you know, on, on capacity institutions and whether, uh, you know, telecom companies or any other companies are able to use the process to their advantage, and that's the point I think Pratap reiterated, and I mentioned, and there is, uh, uh, let me read out uh, another statement in the summary of the budget which says, uh, comprehensive review and rationalization of autonomous bodies. I don't know what that uh, means, uh, rationalization of autonomous bodies, creation of dispute settlement bodies. Now, you create these bodies, 
uh, but you don't have adequate capacity to be able to give the judgment. And there are multiple, I, I know for a fact, there is multiple evidence uh, in, in the Indian dispute settlement process, both dis uh, jurisprudence and in regulatory bodies, that there is enormous amounts of forum shopping that is going on at the moment, especially in telecom companies. And the high courts, uh, as well as the appellate bodies, uh, they have overlapping jurisdictions, and players are playing that game. Uh, and there